Good evening, and welcome to Grace Community Church downtown. We're so glad that you are tuning in with us this evening. Um, I get to just give a couple of quick announcements, mostly about when we are going to meet in service on July 12th. So hopefully you caught that announcement last week, and um, probably within the last week you've had more questions come up of how things are going to work out. So we created a frequently asked question webpage on our website. So feel free to go to graceb3.org, and right at the top you'll see um, FAQ button, and just click on that, and it gives you a whole bunch of answers to questions that you probably have. Um, Other couple quick things to know about for July 12th is that we are going to do masks as optional for right now. Um, And then also that families are going to have a family sit in for the first three weeks. Um, So those are kind of the announcements for today. So let's dive into scripture. We're going to read Ephesians 2, 11 through 16. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, therefore killing the hostility. This is the word of the Lord. Good evening. Welcome to Grace Downtown. We're glad that you're here. We're continuing to uh, talk about God's word, but also what's going on in our world. We find ourselves in very trying times right now. We have a number of things going on that are difficult in our church and in our world. We have uh, COVID-19 that is still a part of our community. And we, as you just heard, we will be launching live services in a couple weeks, but that does not come without complications. And with even some mixed feelings for us and for you as attenders as well. We find ourselves in a time where we are divided politically, even about COVID-19 and things like social distancing and churches opening. And then we have the racial tensions that we see going on in our world. You may have found yourself, like me, asking the question, what do I do? As you see the news, as you see what's going on in our world or even in our community, you may be asking the question, what do I do? We've heard this question directly after our sermons. Um, A few weeks ago when we talked about race in Exodus, Last week, when we talked about repenting, we heard the question, I understand. God is moving. What do I do? Well, that's what today's sermon is all about. As we talked about last week, um, we talked about putting off the deeds of the flesh, and today we're going to talk about putting on the deeds of the Spirit, and really practically what it looks like to turn towards God and the things of God. As Brooks said last week, repentance is twofold. It is turning away from evil, but it is also turning towards God and turning towards righteousness. So today, that's what we want to talk about. Before we dive in today, I want to do a quick review of last week. Last week, Brooks talked about repentance. He noted that with all the division that we find in our country, there is one thing that we find in common, and that is we feel like there is a need for repentance. But as you heard and saw last week, the problem is we all think that someone else needs to repent. Maybe it is calling the police to repentance as we see brutality. Or it's violent protesters we think they need to repent of lawlessness. Or it's nonviolent protesters who need to repent of disrespecting our country or our flag. Maybe it's non-protesters. They need to repent of being silent. Maybe we think that liberals need to repent of calling everything racism or conservatives repenting of denying racism, churches remaining silent on racism, churches being vocal about racism. 
you may have heard it said that whites need to repent of their white, white privilege or that blacks need to repent of perpetuating a culture of victimization. What we have in common, what this shows, is that we think that there needs to be repentance, but we want it to be someone else. We have a hard time identifying what is going on in our own hearts. Part of that is what Brooks talked about last week, but this week we're going to talk about what do we do. Last week we talked about what to turn from. This week we are talking about what to turn to. Quick disclaimer, we're not going to cover it all. Time does not allow for us to cover it all. It would not be wise for us to try to cover it all. We're really going to stick to the scripture that the Lord has chosen for this day in Ephesians 2. But I encourage you to look back at last week and take a look at Brooks' sermon on the first half of repentance and also the four-week series that we did in December of 2000. And 17. So let's jump into the book of Ephesians. Before we get to chapter 2 in Ephesians, we see what God's plan is for the world in Ephesians chapter 1. As we see our world or our lives in chaos, a question that comes to our mind is, what is God's plan in all of this? Well, we find an answer in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 through 10. In him, meaning Christ, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. This tells us that God's plan is for mankind to be united to their creator, to their God, through the work of Christ and his shed blood on the cross. While we have trespassed against God, God has made a way for us to be made right with him through the sacrifice of Christ. And in this, he has a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things. When we look at this in the Greek, the original language, here is the picture that it is passing on to us. It is God taking all things that have happened in history— that have happened in your life and uniting them together in the fullness of time, at the end of all time, uniting all things that have happened in history, bringing them together and using them for his good purposes. So what is God's plan? To reconcile all things under the blood of Christ and according to the Father's plan. We see in the Garden of Eden from the very beginning, God created man to be in perfect relationship with him and with one another. Then when we look at the end of the story in the book of Revelation, we see God's plan for the end of all things, to unite people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people together worshiping the lion and the lamb for all eternity in the new heaven and the new earth, the new Jerusalem, Zion, the city of God, So that's the beginning, and that's the end. We're in the middle. We're in the middle. Where we see that things are not the way that they should be. We are not in perfect relationship with God, and we are certainly not in perfect relationship with one another. So that's where we find ourselves. So, if God's plan is to reconcile all things under Christ, how is that going to happen? How is he going to reconcile what we see in our society, what we see in our church, what we see in our world, what we see in our own heart and lives? How is he going to reconcile that for his good purposes? First, he wants to reconcile us to himself, and then he wants to reconcile us to one another, which leads us to our scripture for today in Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 16. In Ephesians 2, 11 through 16, we see God's plan to reconcile all things. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made known to both one and has broken down in the flesh the dividing wall of hostility 
by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So there's this dividing wall of hostility that the Apostle Paul is describing here in the book of Ephesians. So how do we tear down this dividing wall of hostility? Well, the first thing that we need to do is we need to first see the wall. We need to see the wall of hostility. First, we need to see the wall of hostility between us and God. Then we need to see the wall of hostility that is in our church. And then we need to see the wall of hostility that is in our world. So first, there is a problem inside of us. As we look at our culture, as we look at our response to the things going on in our lives and in our world right now, we see that there is a problem in our own hearts. Haven't you found yourself over the last three months more angry, more frustrated, more confused than you have been in the past? It can be anything. It can be someone's post on social media. It can be something you see on the news. It can be something a politician says. It can be based on what the state government does or the local government does or an individual business does or a driver in front of you does. There's so much anger and confusion and frustration just right at the surface. The problem is that during these very confusing times, we are seeking to reconcile things outside of God and his plan. We are looking for justification outside of God and who he says we are. We are looking for things to be right and to be made right, and we try our own solutions, and it only leads to more anger, confusion, and frustration. Even if you take the example of protesting, if you are protesting often, you find, try to find your justification in you're speaking out or you accuse protesters of doing the wrong thing and you're looking for your justification there. We're trying to find our identity. We're trying to find our justification in what we say about the issues or what we do instead of who God says we are. We are looking for hope. We are looking for justification. We are looking for identity in our tribe the political group that we belong to, the mask or no mask crowd, the protest or no protest crowd. We are looking for reconciliation in division, and it's not there. We're identifying by our group instead of who God says we are. So there's a problem in us. There's a dividing wall of hostility that we think is just between mankind and mankind, or skin color and skin color, or police or no police, or mask or no mask, but actually we have to start by looking at our heart, seeing that there's something wrong in our heart. Next, there's a problem in the church. There's a problem in the church. When Paul speaks here in Ephesians of the dividing wall of hostility, he is not using something uh, metaphorical, he is not using something spiritual, he is using something concrete to point out what is a current reality in the church of God, in Ephesians and now, some 2,000 years later. The literal wall of hostility that he is speaking of was in the temple, in Jerusalem, in the time that Paul is writing this. There was a literal wall in the temple in Jerusalem, and it separated the Jews from the Gentiles in the temple courts. The Jews had access to the inner parts of the temple, and the Gentiles, which is anyone non-Jewish, could not come into the inner courts and were stuck out in the outer courts. And archaeologists have found pieces of this wall, and they found an inscription on the wall that says, whoever is captured will have himself to blame for his subsequent death. There was a literal wall of hostility in the temple where people were supposed to be coming and worshiping God. There was a dividing wall of hostility. And what was it based on? Ethnicity. There was a wall that said, these people, the Jews, they can worship God in this way, but the Gentiles must be, must be shut out. And if they pass through that wall and they're found where only Jews can go, they're responsible for their own death. 
there was a literal wall of hostility. So, today, what is the wall? What is the wall in church? What is the wall in biblical community? What is the wall in our church? The first wall is we don't think there is one. There was a literal wall in the Jerusalem temple. Now there's not the literal wall, so we don't think there is one. We think everything should just be fine. But what we're really looking for is for people to act like us, to look like us, to be in our tribe. Sometimes, even in our worship and the way we do church, we are more white than Christian. Think about it. Think about worship style. Think about the things that we do, the way that we act. Some of the things that we do, we do because it is our preference, not because it is overtly Christian. That can place a dividing wall of hostility, and that can form a church into a tribe of people that have the same skin color and the same preferences. That's not a church. That's not biblical community. That's a social club. That's a thing of the world. That is not good news, people. That is not biblical community. In our lives, we often want to make things into our image. We want things to look like us. We want things to be safe and easy for us. We want to have a tribe where people have the same preferences as we do. Maybe it's skin color, preferences, politics, how we school our kids, but tribalism kills biblical community. It kills unity. See, difference in the church is not the problem. We are called to be one body, as Ephesians 2 is telling us, but 1 Corinthians, Paul also writes 1 Corinthians, and he says that body is made up of different parts. They have different roles but all one body. See, unity without diversity is just uniformity. It's not community. Let me say that again. Unity without diversity is just uniformity, and it's not community, certainly not biblical community. Often, we think in political categories instead of biblical ones. And when we do that, we struggle to be the people of God. When we have complex questions in our culture and in our world, like what do we do about criminal justice? What do we do about refugees and immigration? What do we do about racial disparities? These are confusing and complicated issues in our society, and I don't claim to know the answers to all of them. But loving your neighbor and being the people of God is not complicated. It's hard. That's the thing. Those complex political issues are hard. They are complicated. Loving your neighbor and being the people of God is not complicated. It's just hard. It upsets the status quo. The status quo is much easier than being the people of God, but is also wrong. To be a biblical community, we can't just do what's easy. Third, what is wrong in the world? I don't think I need to say much here. We can look outside our windows. We can look on TV and see there's something wrong in the world. And it's not just one thing. It's many things. There's a reason we think all those different people uh, that we listed that need to repent, there's a reason that list is long. Because we look at the world and we see brokenness everywhere. Just give one example of how broken and messed up the world is. We have people that are violently protesting, and it's supposed to be about black lives mattering in our community. It's supposed to be about the death of George Floyd, his murder in the broad daylight. It's supposed to be about that. But we have violent protesters who are white, who are bashing in the windows and stealing from small black businesses in the inner city and ruining that 
person's future, who has overcome so many obstacles to start and maintain a business. And we have violent protesters taking that away from them in the name of Black Lives Matter. That is messed up. Our world is messed up. Our response to evil is often evil. Our response to hate is more hate. Our response to violence is more violence, and it is getting us nowhere. There is something wrong. And it's not just out there with people that don't know Christ. It's in the church and in our hearts as well. We have a silent, invisible enemy, the devil, who loves dividing walls of hostility. And he has us as people and as a church and as a society right where he wants us. So we have a problem, these dividing walls of hostility, and we need a solution. It's not going to come from within. It's not going to come from either political party or a third party. And it's not going to come from the world because they don't have good news. So we need a solution. First, let's look at the solution for us. As I said, there is hostility between us and God. But look at verses 12 and 13 of Ephesians 2. Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers of the covenants of promise. And that led you to having no hope and without a God in the world. But now, but now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace. Christ comes in and tears down that dividing wall of hostility that's first towards him. We have hostility in our hearts towards God. James 4 says that God opposes the proud. When we have pride in our own heart, when we look at the actions of everyone else and call for repentance but fail to see where we need to repent, God is opposed to us. Our pride builds a wall of hostility between us and God. Proverbs tells us the fool says in his heart there is no God. If we look at the whole council of scripture, we also see that the fool acts as if there is no God. When we fail to see how we need to repent, we become our own God. We try to justify ourselves. We need Christ to come in and take us from being separated from God and having a wall of hostility towards God to being in right relationship with God. It's the only way forward. We need to allow God to break through. We need to allow him to show us where we don't love well. We need to allow him to show us that we have been loved. These verses, it repeats the phrase, remember. Remember that once you were far off. Remember that you are now in Christ. Remember that Christ has overcome that hostility in your heart. We need Christ to break through our pride. We need to allow God to show us our blind spots where we just don't see things the right way. As Brooke said last week, we don't need to repent of things like white privilege. It's just a fact. If we're white, we have certain privileges, we have certain experiences that are unique to us. Same if you have black skin, same if you come from a different country. All of us have a lens through which we see the world, and it inevitably gives us blind spots. What we need to repent of is not working to overcome those blind spots, to see the things that we cannot see. We need to allow God to show us what we need to see. One practical way we can do is educate ourselves on American history. Not a whitewashed American history, but just a true picture of American history. And more than anything, we need to read God's Word. We are reading more news articles than God's Word. We are reading what our friends have to say. We are listening to politicians more than we are listening to what God has to say. And in these complex times, in these trying times, we are sunk if we do not hear a word from the Lord. Let's allow him to show us our own heart, show us our need for him, and overcome our blind spots by his powerful word. What is the solution for the church? Verses 15 and 16, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two and might reconcile us both to God in one body 
through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. God overcomes that wall of hostility between us and him, but also between one another. He brings people together. We are one race, meaning we are made one people. He created man and woman, and everyone came from that man and woman. There is one race, but there are many ethnicities. And it has always been God's plan for the church of God to be people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people brought together in his name. But first, we have to tear down those dividing walls of hostility, especially the ones that are based on preference. How will we ever tackle the problem of racism in the church when we have trouble being close to people that have a different opinion than us on whether to wear a mask or not, or what to do to school their kids, or what to do about politics? How will we ever overcome those things to be the people of God when we are very different? Practically, we need to ask and listen to people instead of talking and fighting. There's a lot of talking and fighting and not enough asking and listening. Some practical ways we can be the church. There is a citywide worship night coming up this month or in the month of July that we'll keep you updated on where we're joining from other ch- with other churches to worship God together, to look like the people of God coming together that have different preferences, different skin colors, different music styles, all to worship God. We need to have conversations with people. Hear what I say when I say conversations. A conversation requires listening. Sometimes we think we had a conversation when it was really just a monologue. We need a lot more dialogue and listening. We need to pray. We need to pray that we would be the people of God. Lastly, the solution for the world. When Christ breaks through our hostile heart towards him, when we kill hostility between one another, then we can look to our culture and try to be the solution. We're jumping ahead and trying to fix all the world's problems through politics and social media and our opinions and news articles. We are trying to fix our world and we are ignoring what's going on in our heart and in our church. There are things going on in our world that are just not right. But first we have to address what's going on in our heart so we can see clearly. In Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail, he lays out what we should do before we protest or before we try to tackle racism in our culture. He says, in any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps. Collection of facts, determine whether their injustices are alive, negotiation, self-purification, and direct action. We need to purify our hearts. We need to listen well to others. We need to do the research, and then we need to be moved to action. We need to be the people of God. We need to hear from our God. We need to love one another well, and then go out into the world and be the people of God. We need to look to undo any unjust system. That means we need Christians involved in peaceful protesting, praying like crazy in their prayer closet in their own house. We need Christians in law enforcement. We need Christians in education. We need Christians in social services. And we need Christians in every neighborhood. We will not win the fight for Christ on Facebook. It will be through loving well and changing unjust systems. You can give to organizations that are doing good in our community. Places like Dream City, Iowa, is doing great things to empower fathers in our community, especially men of color in our community. You can give towards places like Faith Academy, where my own kids go to school, where they are doing great things for some of the the least of these and the families that are in poverty or in need of good education here in Iowa City. And we need to speak out. We need to listen well and then speak out to be a voice for the voiceless. Ephesians chapter 2 ends with Paul saying, In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. God wants to make us into his dwelling place so his Spirit can come and live inside of us. And then in Ephesians 3 he says, that the Spirit comes in us and we are in Christ, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and the authorities in heavenly places. We are to come together as one body, one Spirit, 
No matter what our ethnicity, our background, our socioeconomic status, our skin color, we are to come together and be the people of God. And so in these trying times, the world can see the manifold, the constantly unfolding, the multi-sided picture of the wisdom of God. Instead of fighting on Facebook and for all the world to see, we are supposed to be loving well for all the world to see. Let's pray and act to those ends.